Welcome all. Today was the uh, 15th of uh, Av, um, middle of the month of Av. Magnificent full moon yesterday morning. In fact, I had this early morning drive um, where in the front of my car uh, was the moon in its full glory. Um, and behind in a rear view mirror, I was watching the sunrise. Uh, and the colors and the combination was absolutely, you know, amazing. The dim light of the sun behind me and that bright, uh, virtually full moon. Uh, so I was open for a repeat this morning, um, but no, it was completely fog uh, over. Uh, and, and, and I didn't have the spectacle once again. Uh, although I think the Molad was the day before Rosh Chodesh. So yesterday was probably the actual astronomical full moon. Um, the full moon of the month of Av um, is described in the Mishnah uh, as one of the greatest holidays known to us. Um, which I can just find how we do this here because that button seems to have disappeared. Um, oi. Share, share, share screen. There we are. Um, this is a statement from the Mishnah. In uh, at the end of the tractate Tanit, um, that there were no greater holidays in Israel than the 15th of Av. This is a partial quote. Um, the full quote uh, goes as follows uh, here from straight from the Mishnah. Rabbi Shimon Gamaliel tells us uh, that there were no more no days as joyous for Jewish people as the 15th of Av and Yom Kippur. Um, it's a very strange kind of bedfellows here, 15th of Av. Yom Kippur, um, and, and uh, what took place then is uh, that um, it was a day where um, it was very uh, propitious for arranging a shidduch. Uh, so this was when uh, the daughters of Jerusalem would go out um, in the vineyards wearing uh, white dresses, white clothes that they had borrowed from one another, uh, and the Talmud says that's not to embarrass the one who didn't have his own white garments, and they would go out and dance in the vineyards, and then they would present themselves to the young men, and they would say, choose for yourself a wife. Um, and so the concept of marriages being arranged on that day is very big. It's taken on um, a strange um, dimension, uh, which is maybe not very complimentary. It's referred to as Jewish Valentine's Day. That's not what it is. That's not when uh, we send chocolates or you know, wine or gifts uh, um, to to known or secret Valentine's. That that's not at all uh, what this festival is. Uh, it's actually got deep significance, and and marriage is 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 one dimension that comes out as a as a consequence. So let's let let's try and find find that work out what the deeper meaning of of this festival is. So the Talmud, you know, questions right away. What is it? This Yom Kippur and, and the 15th of Av. And the Talmud says, okay, um, what is this? Granted, Yom Kippur, this is now the Gemara commenting on the Mishnah I just quoted. And the Gemara says, you know, Roshim Gamliel said to us in the Mishnah, uh, these are happy days. Granted, Yom Kippur, uh, because of the pardon, the forgiveness, the day of which the last of the tablets was given. But what about the 15th of Av? So let's kind of first understand Yom Kippur and what that's all about. Uh, Yom Kippur, day when we got the second tablet. Um, so the, the story kind of stretches over 120 days, really. Uh, and for those who attended, I think it was last year's year when I went over those 120 days and in detail, uh, the Torah was given on Shavuot, 6th of Sivan. 40 days later, we all know what happened. Um, that's the uh, 17th of Tammuz when the, the tablets were broken because the, the Jews had been worshipping the golden calf. So uh, we go from the, the, the closest bond with Hashem at the foot of Sinai when the Jews are riding out. Now, seven Ishma, it's the marriage of the Jewish people and the Almighty. Um, and within um, 40 days, there is the equivalent of adultery in a marriage with being unfaithful. Um, and uh, there's a breakdown. What follows are 40 days, called 40 days of wrath, 
Um, when Moshe has to go and placate the Almighty, so to speak, he goes up to Mount Sinai a second time. Those 40 days go from the 17th of Tammuz, if you count the days, you end up with the first of the last day of, of, of this current month of Av. And then the following day, Hashem says to Moshe, go back up in the mountain and I will give you a second set of tablets. That's the first of Elul, and that ends on Yom Kippur. So Yom Kippur is the, the second marriage, the remarriage, the day of forgiveness. Um, and that's the power of the energy of Yom Kippur, which is a real anniversary. Uh, so imagine a couple who get married, fanciest wedding, um, you know, most superb band, photographers, videos, decor, caterers, Everything. And then, well, a couple's blown honeymoon, or something kind of quite serious happens, um, and it seems this marriage has no future, um, and that's it. They had the best in, there's a get, and, you know, we, we, we're parting ways. Um, and then somehow, good rabbi, marriage counselor, uh, somebody is able to intervene um, and reconcile the couple and get them to see beyond uh, the pain of that uh, incident of unfaithfulness. Um, and yeah, so they, they get married again, but this one is is very different. You know, um, it's a quiet wedding uh, in the shul and the rabbi gathers together, just two witnesses and another few people. So there's a minion that can do all the share of and so forth. Um, it's a quiet wedding. Now, which one does the couple um, celebrate as the anniversary? Um, their first wedding? Yes, that's where they've got the, the album and the video um, and, 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 and the debt to pay up for an amazing uh, uh, you know, evening spent, uh, you know, wasting, spending a lot of money uh, on, on a lot of food. Um, or do they celebrate what's the, the, the real anniversary, which is that of the reconciliation with the power that it has in it? And of course, um, that, that's a much more powerful date. Um, so, you know, possibly... Um, as far as the world's concerned, Shavuot is the first anniversary. Uh, but in, in the depth of the intimate relationship, it's Yom Kippur. Um, so there wasn't the fire and the brimstone and the, the, the mountain smoking. It was very quiet. Moshe came down with the tablets. But that becomes Yom Kippur. That becomes a day filled with that energy, which the Talmud says is, is, is the part and then the second tablet says, oh, it's all the same. It's kind of a, a real marriage to Hashem, the second time around, the remarriage to Hashem, you know, much more powerful a bond. Um, any surprise uh, that this should be a day when, you know, in the, in the midst of the holiness of the day, uh, we're going to take some time off between Musaf and, and, and Mincha and, and have the girls go out in the vineyards and the eligible bachelors follow out and, 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 and look out uh, for the potential for, for Shidduch there. I mean, that's that's a correct thing because we, we're mirroring down here uh, what is the marriage of the Jewish people and God that happened, you know, on high. So we understand Yom Kippur. Um, but, says the Talmud, what about, um, what about this 15th of Av? Like, how does that fit in? Where does that fit in? Um, and the answer is in that, that image that I painted for you, magnificent drive yesterday morning, where that moon was shining in its fullest. Now, what's the relevance of that, the significance of that? is that the Jewish people are compared to the moon. The moon has become the parable of the Jewish people. Yes, because of the waxing of waning, and because, you know, that's, that's uh, you know, our fortunes have, 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 have run. That's how, you know, we've been on top, we've been at the bottom, we've had great times, we've had uh, periods in history when things were not, uh, aye, aye, aye. Um, and we were not quite, quite on top. There's been exiles and redemptions, and that's the cycle. And, and for that reason, the Jewish people are compared to the moon. Um, and the full moon is always a symbol of the fullness of uh, the Jewish people, the completeness, shining completely. In, in fact, many of our festivals are mid-month festivals, 15th of uh, the Hebrew month, which parallels the lunar cycle. Um, so many of our Yom Mutev fall in, in the middle of the month. Think Pesach, think Sukkot, think even Purim, uh, and of course the 15th of uh, Av, as well as the 15th of Shvat, I think those are all the kind of mid-month festivals, but that's a majority um, of them. And um, a month 
So that's true of every month. Uh, when the moon is full every single month, it's kind of an omen. It's kind of a blessing for the Jewish people. But when it comes to the month of Av, that is even more powerful. Um, simply put, the greater the waning moon, the more significant the full moon is. Uh, the, 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 the lower the descent has been symbolized by you know, when the moon was darkest, the greater the significance of the full moon shining in an amazing way uh, at the mid-month point. And of course, if there is a month uh, that um, kind of encapsulates exile, it's the month of, 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 of the Tisha B'Av, the two destructions and, and other things we'll, we'll look at in, in a moment that, that uh, are all associated with that very sad and tragic day. And so the full moon of the Jewish people is, is more significant and more powerful in the month of Av. Besides, what happens in the 15th of Av? And of course, it's very Northern Hemisphere centric, but of course, that's where we all belong in the Northern Hemisphere, even though we, we are hiding here in the middle of winter uh, at the tip of the African continent. Our lands is the Holy Land, and there it is the height of summer. But summer has just reached its height. Um, and from now on, the line, nights are getting longer and the days are getting shorter, or the opposite of what we're experiencing here. Um, in other words, the sun is beginning to lose its strength. It has been and it's more powerful, and now it's going down. Now, if the symbol of the Jewish people is the moon, uh, it says the symbol of the oppressors, particularly in our current exile, which is the Edomite exile. Well, Edom, uh, the Christian calendar, bases itself as a solar system completely, as opposed to our calendar, which is a lunar calendar. The symbol of uh, the nations of the world is the sun. So when we have a full moon at the point at which the sun begins to lose its intensity and its strength, uh, in fact, in the Talmud, and I'll show it to you in the text in a moment, it tells us that one of the dimensions of this 15th of Av, dimension number six, uh, one of the dimensions of this 15th of Av is that they stopped cutting wood for the altar. Um, the uh, Mizbech in the temple had to have an eternal flame. Uh, and the Tamid in the Shul, that's a symbol of that. And from the 15th of Av, you could no longer. Why? Because um, at that point, the sun was no longer as strong, um, and the wood was no longer as dry, and humidity started to fill the air. So it's the, the loss of the intense power of the sun. So if you you know, now have this convergence, this intersection of the, the sun losing and the moon being at its fullest, that is really an amazing dimension to a holiday. And this is why, though all 15ths of the months have this dimension of a, uh, a powerful, a powerful, uh, uh, you know, shining of the Jewish people at their fullest uh, in the month of Av, it's particularly so. There is a very, very interesting medrash. It comes from the book Yalkut Shimoni. Um, and it, it, it uh, where are we? Here we are. And the Yalkut, you know, because of course, what's special about the 15th of Av is what we're trying to explore here. Um, what is the uh, zodiac sign of the month of Av? It's uh, Leo. It's the Arie. Um, here is what the Yalkuchimoni says about this month. Um, we'll come back to that. The lion. Um, that's Arie, the lion, the arose during this month of Arie um, to destroy the Beit Hamikdash, which was called Ariel, the lion of God. Uh, in fact, uh, um, there's commentary that the shape of the Tamiglash was like a crouching lion. On condition that the lion, that's Hashem, will come during the month who silence the lion and rebuild Ariel, rebuild the Holy Temple. So this is, um, doesn't sound as good in, in, uh, um, in uh, English as it does in the original text. Ba Ariel, Bechodesh Ariel, Ba Ari, Bechodesh Ari. The Hechriv Ariel Al Menat Sheyavo Arie, the Chodesh Arie, 
the Yivne Ariel. So that sounds you know, much more powerful uh, in, 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 in the Hebrew, of course. So one, one, one finds that in this month of, um, of, of Elul, there is the power already of the rebuilding, of the reconstruction. Um, yes, Arie, um, uh, Nebuchadnezzar came along, and, and we have that image of the lion destroyed. Um, and, and uh, you know, there's a kind of a philosophical stroke, a question that is raised against Hashem um, regarding the destruction of the temple. Uh, and the question goes as follows. Um, we're told that the commandments that God gives the Jewish people, he fulfills himself. There's this very interesting uh, discussion, and you may, may have heard many Bamutsu boys talk about, well, you know, God tells us to put on to film, uh, in to film and says, Shema Yisrael, what does it say in God's to film? Because clearly if he tells us to put on to film, so does he, and the answer is, well, our to film say, listen, Israel, God is one. In Hashem's to film, there's the verse, Mi Amacha Yisrael Goyechad, who is like you people, Israel, one nation. So the, the premise is that God fulfills the commandments. He doesn't just, just give them to us, uh, and that's brought down in, in, in that Medrash to Hillim and other sources, um, that God is not one of those who gives instructions and say, no, do as I say, not as I do, uh, but he actually fulfills the mitzvot himself. Um, so there is a prohibition against destroying places of worship. How did God break his own rule um, by destroying the Beit HaMikdash? Um, and the answer is that you may destroy this mantle. I see a number of Constantia uh, congregants here on the Zoom. Um, you may take down a shul to rebuild another. Um, please, God, uh, good luck on, on the rebuilding. Uh, I saw on a WhatsApp that uh, the, the attempt tonight of uh, establishing the shul wasn't so successful. So, please, God, the power of two baths tomorrow should be better. Um, taking it, um, you may dismantle the shul to rebuild another. Um, and in the Hebrew text, where it says Hashem destroyed the temple in the month of um, in the month of Av, um, on condition Al In other words, the destruction was for us to get something bigger and better, which is. Uh, the third temple that will come, well, the second temple came after the first, and the third, which will come after this exile, um, and, and, and will go from there. So um, there's already, within this month of Av, the potential for that um, rebuilding of something bigger and greater. But if you look at the word Arie, that's the lion, we can see that in this month of Elul, there's also another potential, uh, and that is for the Yemei Ratzon, the days of, of divine forgiveness and closeness to us. Um, and the Aleph, of course, is uh, Elul. The Resh is Rosh Hashanah. The Yud stands for Yom Kippur. And the He stands for Hoshana Rabbah. And that's the, 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 um, this whole concept, this whole days of which I call from beginning to end, 51 days of Yemei Ratzon, um, or uh, days of will. What do we say during those days? We say Hashem, Hoshia Na, and Nun Aleph, that's the numerical value of 51. So during those 51 days, we have this, uh, you know, the month of Elul, which is the month of Teshuva, the month of Rosh Hashanah, when, you know, we are remembered by Hashem. Yom Kippur, which is the forgiveness, and Hashanah Rabbah, which is a, a final opportunity of, of reuniting with Hashem and, and, and getting a positive judgment for the year ahead. Um, so um, we already have within this month of Av, which is Mazal Aria, which is a zodiac of Aria of the line, we already have the potential for uh, those days uh, that are going to follow. So we've got something very, very powerful uh, going on here. Also, uh, like to mention that um, the fifteenth um, of Av is forty days before the twenty-fifth of Elul. Now, what's the relevance of that? Twenty-fifth of Elul is when the world was created. Rosh Hashanah is the sixth day of creation. That's when man was created. But the actual world, Bereshit, uh, that happened six days earlier on the 25th of Elul. Um, so if you go backwards, 40 days, um, and, and the, the, the creation is a process that happens as a result of a, a prep of 40 days. Uh, it always talks about 
Arba im Yom Kodum Yitzhak, about 40 days before a baby is formed. So formation, creation, and it's for us. So we, we actually going into the Rosh Hashanah mode from today uh, and, and, and onwards, um, and interesting uh, custom to start wishing people Shana Tova, Tekatevo, Tekatevo, they should be inscribed and sealed for a good year, starting from, from today, even though uh, it always gives me the shivers because I don't want to be reminded as a rabbi that Rosh Hashanah is kind of only, um, what is it now, six weeks away. Uh, we, we'd like to kind of try and be in denial about that a little bit longer, um, but that, that's that's a reality that it's in this month of um, of Av, we have we have um, the potential for the power of that month to come. And so the 15th of this month has a, a, a particular dimension. What I'd like to do is take you into the Talmud uh, that asks that question, which we kind of left hanging there on the screen, um, how do we understand the 15th of Av? We know about Yom Kippur. What about the 15th of Av? So let me open up the page of the Talmud, uh, which we had there before. It was here, right? Was it here? Yes, no, here. However, what is the special joy of the 15th of Av? And let's go right to the answer. So the Talmud uh, quotes six different rabbis. We're going to give us reasons, uh, each fascinating in their own right. Um, each sufficient um, to explain why this should be a joyous day. Uh, Rabbi Huda, that's reason number one, quoting Shmuel, he says this was the day when members of different tribes were permitted to enter um, another tribe by intermarriage. Now, there was a decree. Uh, it was after the, the, the rule of the Doros of Slavchat uh, that introduced um, introduced um, her inheritance by daughters where there are no sons um, and they could then inherit their father's estate uh, the tribes folk of Menashe came along and they said if they inherit a portion of what's going to be our ancestral land a portion of our tribal land and then they um, marry out of the tribe um, then what's going to happen to that land? Suddenly we will have sections within the middle of the province of, of Manasseh, uh, kind of belonging to the tribe, you know, where Tzavchah's daughter married into. And there was then a decree, it's actually in the Torah, it's the Pasha, a few weeks ago, no, they must marry within their own tribe. Now, um, we understand the reason for uh, this decree, but it was very limiting in that it kind of, you know, created... Uh, um, you know, segregation, uh, division, where they were forced to, that decree did not last beyond that initial generation, and it was repealed on the 15th of Av. Uh, so it's kind of a good day because it, it shows reunification of the Jewish people. Rav Yosef uh, quotes Rav Nachman as saying it was the day when the tribe of Benjamin was permitted to enter the congregation. Um, that was after there was a terrible a tragedy with the concubine in uh, Giva, um, which resulted in civil war. I'm not going to go into the details, but as a, as a result of this, the tribe of Benjamin was kind of excommunicated, and there was a decree in it that the Jews would not marry uh, within Benjamin, and they would kind of remain pariahs, um, and that fortunately didn't last uh, very long, and again on the 15th of Av, is many years after that first 15th of Av, um, that decree was set aside and Benjamin was fully reintegrated into the Jewish people. Um, so what I'm showing you here, well, we're going to carry on, uh, but this is um, the antidote to Tisha B'Av. I'll show it to you a bit clearly in a moment. Um, Rabbi Barachana said it was a day on which the death of the Jews in the wilderness ceased. So um, the death in the wilderness, that was decreed on the 9th of Av. That was after the spies came back with that terrible um, uh, uh, report on the Holy Land. Uh, the Jews said, we're not going to do it. And to, 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 uh, to quote the Gemara, Hashem said, we replied, uh, you know, for no reason. In the future, this will be a day in which there will be reason to cry. That's the 9th of Av. Um, and the death of the entire generation is decreed on that day. Uh, of Av, and the death happens not randomly throughout the year, uh, but a, a, a 40th of the entire Jewish population dies 
um, every uh, uh, Tisha B'Av during the next you know, 40 years in the desert, and it becomes a real tragic year because, I mean, there's so many yachts and so much Kaddish, you know, being said on that day. Um, but, I mean, there were so many people dying each year on Tisha B'Av um, that the people who were kind of reaching the age uh, of, uh, you know, leaving this world as a, as a result of this decree dug their own graves and that before um, and emptied the graves night of Tisha B'Av and, and, and the Jerusalem Talmud tells us um, that's it, you know, and then it was a much easier job uh, because no Chavri Kaddish could have coped uh, with digging that many graves um, at that point. So um, it was quite a sad day. Um, and then came the last year and uh, ninth of Av, nobody done it because the decree was over, but of course uh, nobody was quite sure because they didn't have those, you know, cell phones and uh, diaries on their computers. So maybe they had miscounted and maybe it was only the eighth. And uh, this carried on until the mid month and came to the 15th and the full, the moon was now shining, uh, you know, in the sky fully. And they realized now we, we're well beyond the ninth. Um, and that is when the death of the desert ended. And uh, the Talmud just adds a, a quick uh, digression. It was a big yontif. It was a big yontif because that kind of reversed something which had begun 40 years earlier. Uh, because as long as there was still that death going on, Hashem didn't speak to Moshe directly. Uh, but then it says in Dvarim, um, when all the men of the war... Um, uh, um, were consumed and dead among the people. Then the Lord spoke to me, says Moshe. So it was Moshe's kind of own, own, own personal celebration um, as well um, that on, on that 15th of Av, which of course he didn't get to celebrate the following year because he was no longer uh, with the Jewish people. Um, so that's, uh, was that three? Because this is four. So that was three. Ula said, it was the day on which King Hoshea um, canceled the god that Iravam, son of Mavat, had placed. So um, Iravam, uh, this is part of the division of the kingdom. He didn't want uh, people from you know, the northern kingdom to uh, go to Jerusalem for pilgrimages. So he made roadblocks and he stopped people from going. Um, and the people were not able to um, you know, go on pilgrimage to Jerusalem. They said, look, it's okay. Uh, we've got uh, our own temple now in Shechem. Uh, you don't need to go to Jerusalem anymore. Um, and that actually created, besides political division, you know, the rivalry between the two kingdoms, which was bad enough, but it also that created a spiritual division because now, you know, the people from the kingdom of Judah uh, were, were worshipping in um, Jerusalem, but then the people from the northern kingdom were, were not allowed to go. Uh, and eventually King Hoshea, um, he canceled those gods. 15th of Av is when he, you know, issued that ruling and that became a very happy day. And finally, says Rav Matana, uh, it was also a day in which the slain of Beitar was brought to Berlo. So this is the Bar Re revolt, a few years after the destruction of Second Temple. city of Beitar rises up uh, and holds out against the Romans and continues uh, to be autonomous, independent of the Romans uh, for some time, but that is, of course, a, a thorn in the side, uh, and eventually Betar is overthrown, um, and um, not only are the inhabitants of Betar killed, um, but the uh, fellow Jews around uh, the country are not allowed to come in there and bring them uh, to burial. Um, it was several years after the battle at Betar uh, that finally the Romans allowed the Jews to go in, and bury the dead of Betar, um, and that happened um, on the uh, 15th Av, um, hence further reason to celebrate, uh, double uh, celebration, the fact that the uh, bodies were found, uh, you know, there, uh, and they were allowed to bury them, and that the body actually had not decomposed. Um, and number six, which we spoke about, but that's the idea that they Stop chopping trees for the arrangement of wood that burnt on the altar. Um, and that's because the strength of the sun grows weaker. And we've already you know, discussed that a little bit earlier on. Um, what's so relevant about um, these five events that we celebrate on, on, on the, on the uh, 15th of Av is that they're the antidote, um, so to speak, the opposites to the tragedies of the 9th of Av. Um, and here they are. Um, the decree that uh, they would die in the wilderness, which was cancelled, and the destruction of the second, sorry, the first and the second temple, that's numbers two and three, and the destruction of Beitar, the fact that the city of Jerusalem was plowed, 
And we're told that the uh, destruction of Jerusalem happened as a result of lack of unity within the Jewish people. Um, and um, the 15th of Av, all of those dimensions that I listed, they're all about undoing the, the tragedy of Tisha B'Av and bringing the Jewish, the Jewish people closer together, uh, breaking down barriers and, and closing it up and, and, and making us all in, in, into a nation again. Hence, just like the celebration of Yom Kippur, uh, was one where we celebrated marriage uh, on the 15th of Av. We also celebrate that dimension of marriage. Now, it's 8 p.m. and it's winter and it's a bit too late to organize uh, dances in the vineyards. Um, even if uh, you are in Cape Town and there are vineyards, um, I don't think anybody's going to go out and dance there uh, this evening. What can we still do to celebrate the 15th of Av? If it's a festival, well, if there's a shidduch you want to arrange, then pick up the phone now and make the suggestion and maybe something good will come out of it. Uh, but beyond that, it's a festival of Jewish unity. So it's a wonderful opportunity, even at 8 p.m. South African time, um, to think of something you can do uh, in a tangible way to increase Jewish unity, a phone call, a text, uh, you know, uh, uh, an email um, that's going to bring people closer together. Uh, is, is an amazing way in which we can celebrate the Tuba. But even if you can't do it now, um, then resolving to do it and making a note in your diary that this is on your to do list for tomorrow is also going to count. So I wish you a good Yantav, a wonderful Tuba with that which uh, remains of it now, uh, and a good night. Keep warm. <laughs>